Okay. We're gonna start? Yeah. Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Chen Li from UC Irvine. So he's a professor in the Department of Computer Science there. Uh, he received his PhD from in Computer Science from Stanford University in 2001, and his uh, Master and Bachelor's degree from Tsinghua University in 2000, oh sorry, 1996 and 1994. Um, his research interests are in the field of uh, data management, including data cleaning, data integration, uh, data intensive computing, and text analytics. He was a recipient of the NSF Career Award, several Test of Time Publication Award, and many other grants and uh, industry gifts. He was once a part-time visiting research scientist at Google. He founded a company called the Search2, to develop an open source search engine with high performance and an advanced feature from ground up using C++. Without further ado, let's welcome Professor Chen Li. Thank you, Yunyo. I hope people, remote people can, can hear me uh, well. Um, thanks for having me here. Uh, it's good to see many familiar faces, including one of my former students here. Um, so the, the topic of the talk today is about uh, something between uh, text processing and database management. And the work, I want to say, is work in progress. And we've been working on, on this topic for the last uh, six months, uh, partially influenced by my uh, interaction with uh, the, the uh, Yun Yao's team uh, on System T. And I would love to take this chance to tell you what we have been doing, what our vision is, and uh, I would also get, uh, what would like to get your feedback on the direction we are we're headed. Okay, the motivation is text. And we all know for this audience that uh, text is everywhere. <coughs> and a large portion of the information we're dealing with is in the form of uh, text. Now the, the main question is how to manage text, how to store the text, how to index the text, how to query text, and then how to do reasoning about text. Now, there are a lot of tools available on the market for uh, text processing. Uh, at, at least some of them. Clearly, by no means, this is a complete list of uh, all the tools. Uh, first, databases. I mean, we have lots of experts in the database field. Uh, all the database systems, they do have uh, some basic support of text processing. Like, uh, take MySQL or DB2 as one, as one, as one example. You can do a uh, keyword search um, using the right syntax. But for most uh, very heavy traffic website, websites, they don't rely on a database uh, to do very advanced text processing. Mainly because, from my perspective, text was not the main goal of database systems. Text is treated as a second class citizen. Uh, and for most uh, web, uh, heavy uh, traffic web, web servers, they tend to use like another middleware layer, like a, like a search engines, like Lucene, Solar, and Elastic, to name a few, because this middleware uh, layer is mainly designed for uh, making uh, t uh, text search much, much better. They build their own inverted index structure, they do their own advanced uh, text processing, such as uh, stemming, uh, tokenization, uh, stop words, and that is not the, 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 the strength of a database system. Okay. Uh, in addition, there are also a lot of packages for natural language processing. Here I only list uh, uh, one of them, like a Stanford NLP, but there are other tools available on the market. And then LinkPy is one more package for uh, doing uh, text uh, processing. And then uh, IBM here, uh, you have a, a project on system T. And our work is partially uh, motivated by, by your work as well. Okay. I need to get used to this little point right now. Okay, so what's our vision? Uh, the vision is, based on my uh, past experiences in research also uh, from the startup, uh, I noticed that uh, in many cases, text it tends to be processed in the in a pipeline way. Okay, you you have some original data. You want to do some operations. First, maybe put the data either at, at the, in files or inside the database system, and then on the data you can do some uh, processing, say the keyword search or a uh, rev expression, or you can use a dictionary to do some uh, labeling of to, to 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 extract entities, or you can do more advanced uh, machine learning or deep learning algorithms. And it tends to be processed in a pipeline uh, fashion. Uh, but uh, very often, 
uh, this pipeline tends to be uh, very ad hoc. Uh, it tends to be written in some languages or it's a, such as a Python, Java. In addition, a lot of uh, uh, processing, they do share some common operations. But uh, those operations, they are implemented in an ad hoc way. Uh, and another problem is um, many of these operations, they cannot benefit from any available index structures. They tend to, if you had a data set of say uh, 500 million documents, these operations tend to process those documents one by one. But using database terminology, we tend to use a scan-based approach. Okay? And this kind of approach is good because you can, can uh, apply very advanced uh, logic for each document. But the, the drawback is, if the data gets too big, then you need to do a lot of operations on your data, then you have to do it again and again. But one example we, we have experienced was, say we do a regex. Okay? One, we do a regex expression, uh, expression um, uh, one data set we're using, which is uh, Magellan Publications, which has about uh, 26 million uh, 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 abstracts. And based on our initial experiment, running that experiment on the entire uh, collection of 26 million records will take possibly uh, hours or even days. And that's not very acceptable for many applications. And plus, in some cases, you have one record expression, and suddenly, for some reason, you want to make a ch minor change to regular expression based on the need, and then we need to run it and whole thing again. That's another maybe uh, one day or two days. Or maybe your data has changed slightly by adding maybe 10,000 more documents. You might need to run the documents again, run, run, run regex again. Or if you have a, a, a dictionary of the city names or company names, you already run some operation on your documents, and for some reason you added uh, maybe five more cities or you deleted some of the cities then you have to run the whole thing again. So this kind of uh, uh, repetitive operations are very time consuming. It'd be really nice if this processing can benefit from availability of some index structures. Okay? So based on all these observations I've seen, uh, we have our vision of the following, which is we want to build a text-centric data management system where text is treated as a first-class citizen. So this <coughs> one is designed just for text. Of course, we all know for system people, when you build a real system, for, even though at a high level it's all database system, but for different purposes, for different uh, uh, types of data, different applications, at a very low level, you uh, make many, many different decisions. And, and take databases, for example, that's not the main focus of database systems. And, but for the system we want to build, we want to treat text as a first class <coughs> citizen. We want to provide some primitive support for some of the uh, most uh, uh, widely used operations. We want to put them, uh, make them available from the system. So do you intend no? to make it both text-centric and data-centric, or, or is it really a text management system and not a database system? Uh, the question is really about whether it's uh, text-centric or data-centric. Well, I wonder if you should be and. And would mean you, they're both first classes. Well, for us, uh, our decision is mean on text. I well, view text as one of the kind of data. So it's just text. And I think when I go through some of the basic operation we already support, maybe the, the question will become, uh, will become, can become more, or more clear. So why I call it a text management system? Good. Uh, I'm not very religious about the name. Okay. Okay. This is just a one, one template for now. Um, so one thing is we want to uh, make it uh, uh, possible for applications to put your data into the system. Then you can treat it more like a uh, like story layer, you don't need to worry about uh, storage, indexing, that kind of uh, uh, low-level details. And plus, this system can provide you some basic primitives that are commonly used by many applications. And then, then you don't need to worry about how to implement another very efficient regex expression evaluator, or or uh, entity matching, or other operations, or even uh, for some more advanced operations like NLP. So those primitives will be available to applications. And one more thing we want to do is, for some of these operations, if they are indexable, they can be used by available, say, inverted index, then we would like to see if, for that query, we, don't, we can avoid a scan-based plan. And that can speed up your app development much, much faster. So these are the few goals we want to achieve. Yeah, so this is, the focus is mostly on the query and search part. But what about the curation part? Uh, search is <coughs> one of it, and I think maybe I can tell you what we have done so far, and then what have we have not done uh, yet. 
Yeah, but there is also the curation part. Right, so we, yeah, we need the curation, or that's a separate. Uh, well, have we have not done that part yet. Okay, okay. I think it, be, it could be the on the, our roadmap here. <coughs> uh, so, in addition, our vision is we would like to borrow what we have uh, done in the database community, which is, uh, but we can provide a, a declarative language for the you for the programmers to say what they want. And this is, has not been done yet, but this is our, our goal. Um, at the same time, I want to make it very clear that this is not a system that, do ev that does everything. Okay. Th th that would be stupid to make that position, because we know tax processing is very complicated, and there are many other things that's not our uh, role to play. And the role we play in the whole ecosystem is, if we have this ecosystem of multiple steps of tax processing, we would like to play the role of the first step, where you can put it at there. You can just don't worry about the loss of data, and then, and in addition, you can use this layer to do some very basic primitives very efficiently. And once you get data, you can do what everyone do based on your logic. And this is the role we want want to play in the ecosystem. So a few requirements. The first requirement, uh, based on our database experience, is uh, we want to make it declarative. We want to make it composable using basic building blocks. Uh, here we we know we, we use operators, so we want to model all those operations uh, as basic operators with the same interface. Then we can combine the different the small building blocks to <coughs> come up with a more kind of <coughs> fancy and more expressive query plan. Okay. The second one is it has to be efficient. If your query processing could benefit from available index structures and algorithms, we want to do it. Okay. And one of the examples we show is regex. How can we make regex indexable and more efficient? So this is the architecture uh, of our system we have been developing. Uh, we call it TaxDB. From name, you can see what we are, we are after. Um, so uh, at the bottom layer, we decided to lose to choose Bushin. And I'm going to explain why we make that decision. This is a decision we made after a, a long uh, thinking process. Uh, we used Lushin because Lushin is, uh, has many good things I'll talk about later. And on top of this uh, storage layer, we build some basic primitives or operators. <coughs> Currently, we already supported a few operators. I'm going to explain them one by one. A keyword search, digital match, a few other operators. And then uh, we have, uh, on top of it, we can use the basic operators to com compose uh, more complicated plans by combining the basic operators. And the one in the red uh, in the dotted box is not some, something that we have not done yet, which is well, after we finish this one, make it reliable and uh, efficient, we would like to have a, <coughs> a, a language layer that is um, declarative, and then that, that clearly that query needs to be compiled and be optimized and translated into some physical plan that is consists of these basic operators. Okay, uh, and then here uh, for those applications, we, we put a system T as an example because as mentioned earlier, uh, for for some operations system T is doing, I would like to see whether this system can benefit your operations by making some operations indexable and more efficient. Okay. And when we made these decisions, uh, we thought about uh, uh, a lot. Uh, because we were building a system, uh, and the, the context is, uh, uh, people, for people who know me, we, we have done lots of work in the space of data management. We know how the data engine is designed, and uh, the, the, the pros and cons of a database system. And here, we largely uh, borrow the idea from the database community where uh, operators uh, are the basic building blocks, and they can be used to combine uh, to, to form more complex plans. Yeah, the other one decision we have made is Lushin. Uh, the reason we use Lushin, uh, the simple answer is we can we can stand on the uh, shoulders of the giants, and we could uh, start from scratch to build a storage layer, uh, because we did it we did it, we did it before in a few other systems. Uh, but at the same time, based on my personal experience, I felt that uh, building a database, uh, uh, database storage engine from scratch could be very, very challenging, uh, especially when you deal with incremental updates, uh, concurrence control, all the issues. It takes lots of time to make sure the system is efficient and reliable. At the same time, Lushin has been proven to be uh, the leading uh, solution in this space, uh, and it's very very performant. In addition, it has very a rich set of uh, analyzers and uh, uh, query support. And, and, and internally, it has a 
pretty powerful and very nice index structure to support many operations. And some of the operations we want, we like to support, uh, we were able to convert those queries into some queries on top of Lushin. So, so these are the, the good the benefits can get by, by using the Lushin engine. Okay. Now we didn't use the Solar A layer because we want to treat it in libraries so currently. Solar is a separate web server layer that, that we do want, we do not want to borrow. Uh, so and forget about the Elasticsearch. I don't know much at all about what we've seen. Like, what is this normal environment? What, what do people use it for? Uh, it, many people use it for a search, search, search. I think even for IBM, IBM the field project using the machine. Yeah, IBM. I, thought I, yeah, I think IBM is one of the big supporters of the machine. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Yeah. Elasticsearch. Yes. Solar. Correct. And you think, I think IBM, 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 cloud, actually, yeah. IBM also invested tremendously in Elastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Elastics is more on the parallel setting where you have a <coughs> cluster of machines, right? Yeah. But, but for us, since we're building the engine bottom up, we choose to choose this library layer, not the solar layer, not the Elastic search layer. So we start from there. And, and, and since for this uh, uh, text domain, uh, most operations do not require a join operation between multiple documents, uh, I, 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 I believe for large data sets, it, it can be easily uh, partitioned into bottom machines. We can easily build a separate layer to make it uh, scale. So that's why we picked the machine library. Um, at the same time, uh, we have some benefits. We also need to live with uh, the limitations of the machine. And uh, in fact, for some of the operators we try to implement, we encounter some barriers whether the machine can support it. The good thing about the machine is it's very uh, powerful. At the same time, it's very encapsulated. And it, it it's not easy for you to get into the library to make some low level changes. And plus, you do want to and make low level changes because it had to be very compatible with the future releases. So we have to treat it as library, uh, but also we have to live it with the current limitations. I'm going to talk a few pl places where we already encountered the limitations of Lushin. Okay. Now, our vision is general about text processing, but at the same time, given our initial stage, we want to stay focused. We want to just focus on information extraction. <coughs> Plus, information extraction itself, I believe, is already a very big market. And if we can succeed in this direction, we already have kind of impact. So this is an overview of the rest of the talk. Um, I'm going to first talk about the few operators we already implemented. Uh, and then we talk about the one particular one, which is regex, which is pretty interesting to, to look at the details. And we talk about uh, some initial form of number. And then we talk about uh, our future uh, open <coughs> challenges we, we are facing. Operators, I think most people in this audience know. Uh, we borrow the same idea from database systems. So each operator is supposed to implement these three, three functions. Open, where you do the initialization, uh, resource allocation, and then you get next tuple, then the, the caller of this operator can keep calling this, this operator to, to, to generate, to, to, to suck all the results from the operator. And this operator can implement its own get next tuple by talking to its children which also provides those uh, same interfaces. And then at the end, you do the close and you re release all the resources. And we want to use the same idea for managing text. Now, this is a list of operators we have already implemented in the last uh, five months. Um, I'm going through some of them, and th there's some other op operators are still on the roadmap, and I would love to get some feedback about some other operators you would like to include in an amazing roadmap. Okay. The first one is keyword matcher. Okay. Very natural because a text, keyword search might be the, the, the most natural way to get information out of your text. And uh, here, uh, the, the idea is, uh, one, one example is I want to get all the documents mentioned in Zika, Olympics, and Rio. Right? And here, I give you a string and we want a system to find uh, those documents mentioning those three keywords. So when we design this operator, uh, currently we support three different kinds of uh, semantics. The first one is just a very simple conjunctive query. I just uh, use analyzer or tokenizer to, to divide, to, to, to tokenize your string to multiple tokens, and then I treat it as a conjunctive query, ignoring any position information. Here, uh, Lushin has a very rich set of uh, analyzers uh, based on your language, based on your, your need. And here we use a, the, the default or the most popular one, which is called a, stand for a st standard analyzer, which uses uh, which is very common for English language. <coughs> so is the answer to a query going to be a set or a sorted list? Uh, the answer to the operator is really uh, 
in a set. They're using a database. Uh, so there's no, semantics. this one's better than that. Just every single one that has Correct. There's no it, order no here. No matter how many times the word appears, no matter what, just boom, they're all there. Yeah, so, so here it's using this database concept. There's no, there's no ranking, uh, and there's just, uh, there's no order, and the, the operator does not guarantee in, in, in which order the result are returned. Okay, very similar to operator works in, in database system. Okay. Um, so that's a very simple uh, <coughs> uh, interpretation. In addition, we also support two other uh, semantics. Uh, the one is uh, a phrase matching. Phrase matching means a good example is New York, right? The user types in New York, and I want to treat New York as one phrase, and New and York should appear together in your documents, right? Other examples is like uh, uh, Hewlett Packard or uh, uh, Barnes and Nobles, this kind of uh, uh, and, and, and name name entities we want to treat as a phrase, and Lucian supports phrase search, so we want to provide this uh, uh, semantics to, to the user. The third case is uh, really a substring. It gives you a whole string. I just uh, treat it as a raw text of raw uh, substring. I want to find all documents that match this one as a substring. Okay, and uh, for for this is three semantics. Uh, the the first the first two. Uh, are indexable because they can be based on these tokens, and tokens can be uh, queried from the invert index. The third one, we just do a scan. Because some of the operations uh, and cannot uh, utilize the invert index structure. Okay. So, so the real difference then is that in the case of substring, it could start from the middle of the word. So Correct. The, 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 the question is whether the substring can, can start from the middle of uh, a word. The answer is yes. I mean, and that is what distinguishes it from phrase. Uh, correct. Phrase, phrase search. Of full words. <coughs> yes. That yeah. Are ambiguous. Yeah. Phrase has this me meaning of word boundaries. Yes. Uh, Substring doesn't have it. A good example is rain, where we ma match train. Right? Rain is uh, starting from the second letter of train. So uh, at substring matching, rain will find the train. Okay. Do you have a space in the middle of the <coughs> substring? So it has the last half of this word plus a space plus the first half of the next word. Uh, are you talking about substring or a phrase search? Uh, substring. Substring uh, can match uh, the suffix of a previous word and the suffix of next word. That is possible. Because yeah, that is a substring. Is yes. It's consecutive thing. It's a space in the middle. It's just a substring. And they, they treat space in the it's same way as other characters. Right. There's no, right. no special meaning for space. Right. Okay. And, and if your application needs this semantics, we give it to you. Right. Okay. And you, you could do something fancier by, by analyzing the space in, in the query to make it indexable, but then we, we're entering one territory where the meaning of a word becomes very vague. So we, we didn't take that approach. That's why for, for text, that, uh, language process becomes very important. What's the meaning of a word? I mean, even for other languages like uh, Chinese, Japanese, these two languages, detecting the word boundaries is a very big deal compared to Latin languages. Right? Korean is different. Korean is kind of a Latin language. So, so that brings up the question of, so you're not doing n-gram indexing to, even for substring matching, make it uh, more efficient? Oh, okay. The question is whether uh, we can use uh, n-gram indexing for substring matching. I mean, that's a very good question. Currently, we don't do it. Uh, but in fact, it, it's doable. Right? You can generate all the multiple grams and use a gram in index to do it. In fact, that's a good idea. In, in a different system, we do it. Okay. But we can make it uh, work uh, in that direction. So how do you really discover the phrases uh, by using machine learning to do that? Oh, the question was uh, where we get the phrases. Uh, yeah. The short answer is it's a job of the programmer. Right? We, we, that's not our job. Right? And because I, as I said before, I want to make my role very clear in this ecosystem. Right? Okay, and so somebody means outside it, feeding uh, it through a dictionary. Somebody means the user of the system. The user must have given us the phrase how the phrase was formed, that could be done by a different task. At this currently, that's not a focus of this operator. This operator assumes... Yeah, but this operator has to also recognize the phrase in order to find it in the index. So there should be some sort of dictionary that you should be using. But for this operator, we assume the user gives me one phrase, and we, we apply... But the query has, like, you know, words, but you have to discover there's a phrase in it. But the, the user would tell me I'm using a phrase operator. I mean, it has to be very yeah, explicit. But search typically they can do that. But I mean, first you discover phrases are typically nowadays through machine learning. Right. But because there is no dictionary out there, you have to discover that dictionary. 
But when the query comes in, the user doesn't put like double code around the phrase. It just gives the phrase to so have to match the sequence of words in the dictionary to figure out, oh, this is actually a phrase. Yeah. So for remove people, the question really about uh, who gives us the phrase. Again, our answer is, we. this is the decision made by the, by the user. So yeah, the user basically. has to put the double code around. Uh, you talk about the syntax, yes, we, since our, our current text page is running as a library, uh, we, we allow, we give you some example later to see, by passing one parameter, the user is telling the system, treat it as a phrase. Okay. How the, where the phrase comes from, that's not, not the system job. Okay. And that's why I said uh, we're not solving all the problems. So this is uh, the one example of how we use this keyword matcher operator. Uh, again, the text field is currently running in the library in, in Java. Um, here, you can just say new keyword matcher, and we give a predicate. In, when you define the predicate, you can say I uh, use a conjunction index space. Uh, the meaning of this 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 word means uh, uh, the treat this string as a conjunctive query, and then you can use the index space uh, approach. Okay. This is the meaning of that uh, uh, flag. And, and you can also say I can refer replace it by phrase index space. In fact, to answer your question. The user passes this flag. It says, "I want to, I want to treat it as a phrase, and do index-based uh, search." Um, the third one is uh, subject matching here. So it's very declarative, okay. not in the language base, but at the library from a library's perspective. Now, internally, how we do it inside the machine? I want to use this example to show you how we translate some operation of of our uh, library to something internal. Uh, internally, since we, we use uh, uh, a Lushin, what we do is really generate Lushin query. Okay. Again, you don't need to go through detail. The main idea is if you give me one string, I do the tokenization using the standard analyzer, generate all the uh, terms, and I construct this Lushin query using their library calls. And I pass the generated Lushin query to Lushin engine. Lushin, Lushin will run the query and give me the result, and I'm going to consume the results using the get next tuple uh, interface. Okay, this is the internal translation. Okay. Since you're only using the scene, there is no there's no like knowledge graph or the uh, metadata that you collect that from thing to match the scene? So the question is whether we're using Lushin. The answer is yes. Currently yes. Because uh, for now the current focus is how to make those operators implemented and make them efficient. Now, I mean, our, our roadmap is very simple. Let's first make this one work complete, stable, and then based on the needs from applications, we can add more features. So it can be done in the future. Yeah, because typically, you get the metadata in some JSON form. Right? If I look at it from the database viewpoint, it's a mm -hmm. combination of JSON query processing and indexing and Lucene, mm -hmm. not just Lucene. Because Lucene really doesn't understand JSON very well. Yeah, so we are now doing many, many other fancy things. But now our th this position is very simple. We use Lushin to make to implement those operators, and they say how to make them happen, yeah. and how to make them efficient. Okay. And there are many other things we can do in the future. Yeah, I mean the problem is if once you get the knowledge graph, I mean Lushin is just an index, but knowledge graph is far bigger than Lushin. Yeah. So when, that's why I said earlier, we're now using this system to solve all the problems. Okay. We only yeah. solve the basic basic uh, primitives. The second uh, operator we have implemented is a dictionary matcher. Uh, a good use case is if you have a list of uh, drug names or disease names or city names or company names, you want to use your knowledge to do some marking in your uh, documents. So that's Microsoft, this is IBM, that's Google. So this is a one way, easy way to use your a priori knowledge to do some information extraction. So, so, so what do we, the, the way we model it is you have a collection of documents you have a dictionary of entities, and you want to use these entities to do the labeling or matching uh, within your documents. Okay? And, and the currently what we do is we just use the basic keyword matcher. Very simple. Just uh, go through the entities in your dictionary one by one, and for each of them, I just call the corresponding keyword matcher to do the matching of the documents. Now, the uh, here, since we have three different ways to do keyword matcher, we have the three corresponding ways to do the uh, matching for dictionary. Now so there so what's the overall idea behind what the software is doing? Um, let me repeat. Let's say I have a list of company names, okay. and IBM Microsoft, and I have lots of documents. Well, you want to find all I want to find those places that are companies. Okay, this is the purpose of the operator. 
because this is the knowledge already have. You don't need to rely on some more advanced uh, algorithms. This is the basic knowledge you have. You want to use a very s simple way to do the markups of this. So, so what you're trying to do is in one pass, try to deal with many queries effectively. There are different ways to do the evaluation. Uh, and this come out of the joint to some degree, right? We have one dictionary of entities, one, one collection of uh, documents. We want to the join where the join is a substring matching here. Right? You can view it that way. So the current implementation we have is I scan the ent ent entities of the dictionary one by one. For each of them, I call the corresponding keyword matter operator. It's more like an index based scan, uh, 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 join. You can view it that way. Now, uh, other things we can do better, but for instance, if your document collection is not too big, but your dictionary is huge, and this one, the outer region becomes too big, this one becomes too small, you can reverse the order. You can even build a very index you know, dictionary. Right? This is very similar to what we do inside the database system. Okay. In our first implementation, we just do a very simple index based on nested loop join. Okay. There, there's, this is the room for future optimization. Uh, then the question is whether it is more efficient to give everything to Luxing, right, rather than doing the one by one. Uh, Luxing, we didn't try it, but Luxing has uh, certain limitations. If I, mean, if I have a dictionary of, say, uh, 5,000 companies, you could have uh, more like a disjunction of 5,000 entities, but I don't know how well Luxing can handle that kind of a very big, fat query. I don't know. And I, I feel, I. I even Luxin internally let me do something very similar. So, so we, we didn't try that path, but we can do some experiments and, and see how it performs. So what's the user's expectation? Is it a union of all the documents that match those dictionary terms? Or for each term, you want to explicitly view which are the matching terms? Okay, the, the, the question is about the, what is the output of this operator, okay? Um, when we design the operator, we use the same idea inside the database system, which is the output of each operator is also a s stream of tuples. Okay. In this particular case, if I have IBM, Microsoft, or uh, Google, these three, three uh, entities, and then for, say, for IBM, uh, if in my documents I have uh, 10 <coughs> records mentioned in IBM, and for each record, even if IBM appears multiple times, I'm going to return that record in, in w as one tuple. Yeah, Where that I figured, but right. if the same document matches IBM as well as Microsoft, is it going to be returned once or? Uh, it's going to be returned twice. Because we assume every occurrence of one entity, apart from multiple occurrences in one document, yeah. is treated as one tuple with multiple spans. So the output's a multi-set, not a set? And not the the document can appear twice in this set? Uh, well, the each, uh, each tuple uh, return from the operator is the, all the occurrences of one entity in one document. Now, if Microsoft appears, IBM appears two times in document number three, that information is returned as one record. If, if Facebook also appears once in this document, that information will be returned as another two record. You can say more like a, a, a every, every pair of entity and document is returned as one tuple. And, and, and if, if one entity appears multiple times within one document, then that multiple occurrences will be encapsulated as a list of spans. So, uh, we had a discussion about whether we should return spans one by one or a list of spans. And we decided to take this way mainly because I think from the application's perspective, it's more intuitive to deal with one document at, in one batch rather than getting the multiple spans one by one. I think that's easier for the programmer to write their own. So it's more efficient, right? You can yes, yes, we can, we can reduce number of uh, function calls between the next layer and this layer. So this is a decision we made. Okay. Fuzzy token manager, I think this one, uh, uh, example is uh, I have Zika, Olympics, Rio, Games, Disease, Virus. I want to look for all the documents. Uh, mentioning these few keywords, but not, necess not necessarily all of them, maybe four out of six or three out of six. And this kind of uh, operations for people who work in this field, uh, you should know, is very important for many cases like uh, entity matching, schema mapping. 
and even keyword search. In keyword search, my, my classic example is like uh, our former governor, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, right? And everybody knows he's uh, popular as a star, as a, as a politician, but a few people know how to spell his last name. Right? So, so try it if, if without using Google or any other search engine, see if you can succeed. So these kind of cases uh, where can happen where you're looking for some information, but you don't know exact spelling of the, the, the word. But in general, you look for something, but your matching condition is not exact. Okay. So at the time is interesting. I just used this example that happened just two days ago. Right? For, for this case, I hope nobody get offended by this example. So, so in this example, it, it, we have two speeches, and it's a good example of similarity search. If the speech writer had a chance to run some operator to see if part of that uh, uh, Mrs. Trump's speech can match any of the earlier speeches, that, that kind of uh, embarrassment could have been avoided. Right? So this is a the detailed uh, comparison between these two speeches. So the, this is the way you can, the user can use this uh, fuzzy match operator. Um, it's just a fuzzy match uh, operator. You give the predicate, inside the predicate, you give all the information. This one we, we are using, currently we're using the Jakar similarity, or no, the number of common tokens. This is the way we define it. Even though there are other ways you can define similarity. And so when we implemented this operator, where we are uh, in, uh, facing the issue of whether Lushin can do what we wanted. Because for people in this field, uh, you know, there are a lot of algorithms that have been developed in the literature about how to uh, make uh, similarity search really efficient, including some of the work my team did in the past. And we have some, some very nice algorithm to make it fast. The, the question is whether we could use the existing Lushin's API to implement them. This is the, the, the problem we were facing. And we did some analysis and found out that uh, Lushin is not uh, hackable, easily hackable. Uh, so some of our early uh, algorithms cannot be easily implemented using the Lushin's current infrastructure. But the good news is Lushin already has a, a nice feature where you can say when you do the ma match, you can say uh, how many tokens, what's the minimum number of tokens must appear in your documents. We can just benefit from this one here. And it'd be interesting to know if we were uh, we were to implement some of, some of our early algorithms and kind of compare some of the performance, which one is better. But for now, this one is doing what we're doing here. So we, we're pretty happy with this limitation, with this uh, uh, feature. Uh, Stuff NLP operator, uh, and for, for people who don't know what it is, it is a Java package that can do a natural language processing. Okay. And we, we implement this whole thing as one operator for two purposes. The first purpose is we want to see if TextDB can really provide some basic natural language processing operation as an operator. Okay. This is one purpose. Second purpose is we want to use Stanford NLP as a guinea pig because there are many, many other open source packages available there, most of them written in Java. Uh, Wika, other other uh, libraries. We want to see how likely it is to integrate these open source libraries into this framework as operators. Okay, if we can succeed in this operator, maybe uh, this this package, then we have we are getting more confident that we can also include other packages into our framework as long as the license agreement is good. Good, okay. okay. and we succeeded in in this uh, experiment. So here, I mean, we know this is what the Stanford NLP. Uh, package you can do, you do very advanced uh, uh, analysis of your text document. And what we, we, we did initially is, by using this package, we're able to um, do uh, two kinds of uh, uh, entity recognition. One is uh, the named entities, classes, like the numbers, locations, money, persons, dates, and times. And this is the, uh, what the package can provide. The other kind is uh, part of speech, like adjectives, adverbs, nouns, and verbs. And these two kinds of uh, entities are already uh, supported. Um, now, a uh, natural question is, if you use this package, uh, the good thing is this package is very sophisticated, very powerful. Okay? We can do many fancy things. Internally, you can imagine this library has its own uh, lexicons, other knowledge to see this is a company name, that location. Uh, the good thing is it's very powerful. And uh, the bad thing is um, the performance may, may, may suffer 
because this approach will scan your document one by one. And I think many people told me Snap NLP is very powerful, but uh, one of the challenges is its low performance. But we want to include this one into this uh, framework. And we did it. This one is an easy one, uh, which is uh, give a query with some typo and want to fix it. This one has nothing to do with the machine. And this exercise is to show whether you can implement some more advanced uh, operation as one operator. Uh, here, uh, if you miss the space between Olympics and Rio, by running this operator, you can fix it. You can get uh, the one with the space. This one does not rely on the machine. So these, those are basic operators. And I want to pick the next operator, regex, and go through uh, some of the details. How are we doing in terms of time? Okay, uh, 43. All right, so next I want to dive into the details of one operator, regex, because this is something that technically much more challenging than all the other operators. And it's also one of the uh, most commonly used uh, ways to process data and scalability is a big issue. Okay. And we decided to implement this one in, in the system by using an index-based structure, using the vertical index. Okay. Uh, the algorithm we implemented is uh, coming from uh, engineer Ross Cox. Cox. What the, the background is uh, he, uh, about 10 years ago, he was working on this uh, Stanford, no, no, uh, Google Code project. Uh, they wa he wanted to support regex search on Google Code. So he, he, he modified one of the early algorithms and proposed this algorithm. And then this algorithm was indeed deployed in a Google search uh, service. Later uh, was uh, terminated. But the, the, the code is available in, in Go, the Go language. The idea is the following. You give me one regex, okay, like uh, I'll, I'll talk about some examples later. Uh, it's going to generate a corresponding Boolean expression, Boolean query <coughs> using grams. And this Boolean expression based on grams is pushed to the engine to run and give the result, which can have po false positives, and do the post processing by running uh, your automaton on the, those candidates. False positives? Because this one, uh, the, the way to do translation can, uh, can, can give you a, a necessary condition, not a sufficient condition. So it could give you some result that, uh, that don't meet your regular expression. So you need to post process. You need a, a very efficient uh, evaluator of regex expression. Okay. So the example is for that uh, regex rate expression, by going through the translator, we generate this uh, uh, Boolean expression with uh, it's a conjunction of uh, it's a disjunction of conjunctions. Okay. And then this this Boolean query is pushed to to this uh, uh, Lucene engine, which internally has the index, and that that query is evaluated to give you candidate documents, and for every document, you run it through your automaton and do the final uh, verification. So what, this is the what kind of regex uh, does they support? Because what you are showing here, for example, other um, yes. backslash yes. D, backslash W. Yes, yeah, so the, the, uh, the Yon's question was what kind of uh, regex uh, expression we're supporting. Uh, I, I, I didn't include a slide here. So regex, first of all, based on our knowledge, there's no common standard, uh, uh, different libraries, different uh, platforms have different syntaxes. Um, uh, in addition, uh, we we start with these five basic operations, ex expressions, and there's more, more uh, other expressions. And uh, this algorithm may not work for some of the expressions. It covers most of the cases. We can talk about those cases that cannot be covered by, by this algorithm. But, but th this is a simple for, for this audience. So these are the five basic operations to define the expressions in a recursive way. And, and then, uh, one thing, a very, very, uh, very important uh, function is, if you give me a string, uh, how to generate a Boolean expression of uh, grams, if the string is very simple, no, no, no fancy uh, expressions. So here, uh, the algorithm works for, uh, our implementation allows you to use any uh, gram, like a trigrams, bigrams, or four grams, as far as it's just a parameter you can pass to the engine. Okay. The original algorithm assumes it is, uh, it is using three grams. So for the rest of the time, we use three grams, even though you can change three to two or four if you want. Okay. So if we use three grams, if the user is gi giving us A, B, then since all the grams are these three characters, then 
sorry, you cannot use this uh, invert index. So any means you have to process everything. Okay. Now if the query string is A, B, C, D, then when you generate the grams, you have two, three grams. A, B, C, A, B, C, D. And it's a conjunction of these two grams. So in the case of A, B, you can't do prefix search on the trigram? In the case of A, B, the, if you use the inverted index, you can now do it because invert index the basic units are three grams, and, and we are not assuming any try structure here. Okay? If you had a try structure, you could you start use a try to see starting with AB you can have a lot of completions, and each of them could uh, you can be, can have a big uh, disjunction of this uh, three grams. But we are not we're not doing that calculation because I mean there, there'll be too many expansions. But AB can generate too many try uh, try. <coughs> It's, it's a trade-off here. So this decision we made is you just scan everything. Okay, it depends on your, your alphabet, your, your vocabulary. The alphabet. Right? If the alphabet is so small. I, what I thought was <coughs> you just go into, I mean, it's like any other B plus 3 index, right? Right. You can always go in with the prefix of the key. Correct. And it, it's not like you are explicitly completing it. The index itself just. Yeah. I mean, the, the question is, uh, for this kind of uh, AB prefix, whether we can use index structure to complete, complete it. To but I'm saying they will all be contiguous anyway. The, the yeah, but the issue here is, if we had a structure started from scratch, we will have more control. But for our case, since we use Lushin, Lushin doesn't expose that API. Oh, I see. Right? In, in a different setting, we did a try. We did a completion, completion logic, but we didn't do it here. Right? And plus, uh, in terms of performance, I doubt if that a completion piece of proof will be efficient. Because for the English uh, language, AB will have a lot of completions. You have a huge disjunction of a lot of uh, trigrams. It might not, might not be very efficient. You might better just do a scan. We know in database systems, if you touch so many records, it might be better just to scan everything in terms of this guy or performance. Now, if you have a, a set of uh, uh, grams A B C D and X Y W X Y Z set means is a disjunction. A disjunction. Then you generate a, a disjunction of conjunctions. Now, next few slides I'm going to use one example to show how to show the main idea of the algorithm. A lot of details I will not cover, but I think that's 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 good for this purpose. So in this example, I have this regular expression, D A T A star, D A T A star. Just keep in mind the star is on A, is not on D, not on theta. So that means D A T followed by any number of A's, including no A, and then followed by a uh, disjunction of B C D or a P Q R. So this is the meaning of a regular expression. Okay. So give this regex expression with first do the parsing, and we generate the parse tree. So we have three different uh, different kinds of uh, nodes, like a concatenation, it's more like a followed by logic. And then the different nodes are all literals, which are basic scripts. Uh, we have DAT, A, A, the, the uh, modifier is a star, means zero or any number. Okay. And then the BCD and PQR, uh, we do a distinction, which is alter alternation between these two, two, two strings. Let's see how the algorithm works on this uh, web expression. The main idea of the algorithm is for every, I mean, re first regular expression is, is defined recursively, right? The expression is defined using other expressions until you reach the bottom which has uh, all the, those uh, uh, strings, uh, literals. So for every expression in this tree, the algorithm maintains some variables to, make, to keep track of some information. Okay. Uh, the the most important uh, ex variable is a match, which is essentially the corresponding uh, Boolean expression using trigrams. Okay, this is the, the kind of the, kind of the placeholder for the found expression. And then in addition, it keeps track of three var variables: exact, prefix, suffix. And if from the name, you can you can tell that uh, these variables are keeping track of the kind of uh, necessary conditions, meaning for a for a string to match that particular regular expression expression, what suffix that string should have, or maybe a set of uh, suffixes, the string should match. What kind of, what set of uh, prefixes the, the string has to match, or what set of exact strings this one has to match. So these are the three conditions, and these three conditions will be appended to your match 
expression to make your condition tighter and more efficient. Okay? So and then this is the purpose of those three variables. And then when we do some reasoning, when we combine the expressions from the next expression, we need this uh, variable called amplitude as a helper. Amplitude from name you can tell indicates whether a matching string for that regular expression could be an amplitude string. And this variable will be used when we recursively compute all those uh, variables from the next layer from the bottom layers. Okay. So here, this is a parse tree, and let's start uh, from the DAT. So DAT, it is uh, literal, that's not empty, so we know it is not amputable. Okay. So the amputable is uh, false, uh, and then exact match is that DAT prefix, suffix, the all DAT. It's an easy case. Okay. The corresponding match, you call the trigrams function, you get a the simplest uh, Boolean expression using grams. Okay, that's the starting point. So then you go to this this, this uh, uh, literal with a you know, with a subtree here. Uh, so amputable it becomes true because a star could um, could match the empty string. <coughs> and exact we don't know what exact string is. It's unknown. And prefix is empty. And suffix is empty. And match it can match anything. So now we have information about these two uh, subtrees and then when we look at this uh, since when we do the evaluation of this uh, parse tree we do this thing uh, is a kind of a lab associative okay, so we first look at the, these two subtrees and do the contamination which is a uh, kind of a conjunction okay and then <coughs> we wh what the algorithm does it would take a look at these two columns and then based certain based on certain rules it will calculate the variables for the third column Okay. Uh, example is uh, the, the amputable case. Uh, if the first one is false, the second one is true, we do a conjunction because the top level is concatenation, which is a conjunction. So the amputable is a conjunction of these two amputables. Okay. So it becomes false, and there's some other rules you can follow and match. I mean, so by following the rules, you can calculate the, these variables for this new uh, concatenation of the two, <coughs> two, two subtrees. And then do the same thing for this this uh, uh, tree, which is a disjunction, because PCD or PQR, it is disjunction. And then we you, you combine this whole thing, and finally you have this uh, uh, five variables for the whole tree. And then the last match variable is the final boolean expression using grams. Okay, so here the if you draw this way, if you draw the Boolean expression at the tr in the tree <coughs> representation, so it's going to be uh, these three things. Uh, these four things you do the conjunction, and then you do a, a disjunction of uh, these uh, four children, and do a, a conjunction with the DAT. Okay. And then after the w this step, we need to use the three variables: uh, prefix, suffix, and uh, exact. So these these three variables will be generating some additional conditions to your expression to make them to make it tighter because you want to make your query very efficient okay. so you put this additional information from the three variables into your pooling expression tree and that will be the, the expression you can get okay. so once you have the expression you go through a, a step of uh, uh, simplification uh, logic so here we, we, we generate uh, we convert the whole thing into a disjunct normal form uh, by, by pushing this, this uh, uh, conjunct of the conjunction into this piece. And then, after you have this uh, Boolean expression, you, you can apply some other simplification rules. Okay. One of the rules is if A or A and B is equal to A, meaning you can, subs you can remove B because you have A outside. Okay. You apply this kind of rules on this uh, expression tree, and this is a simplified final Boolean expression. The middle part will soon be done as a residual predicate, right? The A star. A star? A the star. Original, in the original expression, you have the A star in the middle. Yes. That would have to be done as a residual for the same reason we discussed before. But, but in the, the trigram cannot be used. Correct. In the process, the algorithm does some, make some steps mm -hmm. to get rid of some of them. So it is possible. It's a tri so the algorithm has to make some trade off 
by, by getting rid of some of the conditions. Because I, I noticed you had some APQ and ABC and like right? The ABQ, which one here? The, uh, the last slide you showed us. Yeah, I mean, uh, there you see ATP. ATP. This one comes from this one comes from here. This comes from over here. So I, I didn't explain how this one generated. It, it's a concatenation of the uh, suffix of the left one and the exact of the right one. But if you get the exact one, you get a suffix one. You concatenate them. That's going to be your suffix. Your suffix. That's why it's getting longer. Oh, yeah. I see. Coming from the initial B A T. Yes. Not so from the middle A star. Yes. Yes. It's not mm -hmm. A star. I think in this example, it might be ignored at the end. It doesn't give you any pruning power. So, in the details of the algorithm, it makes some t certain decisions about <coughs> getting rid of some of the conditions because those conditions, if you treat them very literally, they can give you too many uh, conditions, and that can make your query too big. So that's why this algorithm has a lot of room to be improved. So this is a final simplified uh, expression. Now we can go through some other expressions, see how it works, but the, the main idea is here. Okay. So next I'm going to show you some of the uh, initial perform numbers. And also I want to repeat the fact that uh, these are some, uh, are some initial numbers. We have not done the very deep profiling of where the bottlenecks are. Okay. So the data set that we use is, I mentioned earlier, is a, a medical publication. Um, uh, we mainly focus on the abstracts. This is from Medline. Uh, we, we have a collection of about 26 million records. Okay. And the abstract is the longest attribute in a scheme. Uh, setting, we didn't use a server. Uh, we, we have a uh, the story is we have a whole bunch of students working with me for the last uh, few months, and we just use one Mac. And the, the main message is really about the trend. So don't take the absolute numbers uh, too literally. Uh, first of all, we have to compare this approach with like system T approach where you do a scan. For that kind of approach, you don't pay any overhead of the offline indexing phase. So for us, we've had to pay the cost. Similarly. In, inside database systems, we have to be the cause of creating indexes. Uh, here, we care about two things. One is the, the time to build the index. The other one is the index size itself. And we tried the different sizes. Uh, and the time, you can see, it grows linearly. This is the behavior of the machine. It's not our credit. We just want to see if it encapsulates the machine to do this kind of operations, how, the, how this machine engine works. So the whole thing grows linearly. Uh, not too bad for like a one million records. It takes about uh, um, five, five to six minutes to build the index with about 2.5 gigabytes of index structure. Okay. But when we build this index, I want to uh, emphasize one thing, which is since Luxin heavily relies on the inverted index, uh, Luxin allows you to build different in inverted indexes using different analyzers, and depending on your, your semantics, what do you want to do with, with your data? And this is the result of using a standard analyzer, mainly for English. But when we do the real ex expression uh, evaluation, uh, we have to rely on the uh, inverted index of grams. Okay? That's a different analyzer. So that means if you want to support both queries, you have to build two indexes, one for a standard analyzer, one for a uh, gram, analyzer, gram analyzer. So it's similar to what we do inside database systems. One index is on one purpose. And if we make the whole thing declarative, we can say what kind of index we want to build. Okay. So, and when we do the trigram analyzer, uh, this is the, the numbers, and the numbers I think a little bit higher because they're here. The 340, this is a <coughs> one to 1300, and the reason is, is simple because when you do standard analyzer, you, you generate fewer gram, uh, tokens. When you do gram analyzer, you have, you have more grams to generate. So your, your, your tokens are get, getting more, so your inverted index is getting bigger. So this is a, the cost you have to pay. But you should be able to use the trigram index for the standard one, right? Uh, I don't think we can use the gram inverted index for standard analyzer, because a good example is there's a semantics inside it. Because if you use, say, New York, take New York as one example, right? 
if if uh, New York, if we use a gram analyzer, we gen generate a uh, invert, invert index with a new N E W, uh, E W space, a W space Y. Right? This is our grams. Now, when you do the standard anal analyzer, it should generate new and York two two words. Now, if a query comes in, yeah, but I should use the trigram and then do this, you know. Yeah, I think the performance may, may suck. And the performance will suck. And, and also yeah. the standard analyzer also do a bunch of other things. I think it's turning to lurkers, it yes. also do uh, stemming. Some yeah, it becomes semantically richer. What do you want to do? And I, I, even if you could translate your standard analyzer operation into grams, mm. I mean, you could miss some information or the performance will be yes, there. Lotus Notes always used a uh, uh, bigram for uh, uh, Eastern Asian languages and trigram for the Western languages. But now, uh, one clarification: when you say trigrams or bigrams, I talk about the uh, character grams or yeah, token yeah. grams. Yeah. Character grams. Okay. Uh, but I want to know how they do it. How use how they use that uh, character grams to do like in New York. I, I would love to see how how they do it. Uh, I don't know if there's any paper that describes it, but that's what they did. Okay. Uh, so. Talk about the the, the keyword matcher. Uh, the keyword matcher, we, we randomly pick some of the uh, keywords from from the documents, and then we run run this keyword uh, query using our inverting using Ruchin's inverting index using our operator, which internally uses uh, uh, Ruchin's inverting index. So this is a curve uh, to to show how the number changes given the size of the data. Uh, I should. Uh, these numbers might not be final, okay? Because if see this, this is 100k all the way to 1 million, and the top, the right uh, the, the y-axis in, is in seconds. To me, these numbers are high because I know Lu Xing is very good at returning results in milliseconds. But here we're talking about uh, I mean seconds. Uh, I, so our students are still doing some analysis. My 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 theory here is uh, the whole pipeline has two main steps. One step is running Lucin to get the results. That's one step. The other step is we go through these results one by one to do some post-processing. And I think uh, in the current in the current way we collect these numbers, uh, most of the time is spent in a post-processing step, which could be easily uh, reduced by doing some optimization. So I think a better way to plot these numbers is to separate the time into two pieces: Lucin time and post-processing. I think this one numbers mainly include the bottleneck is a post processing time, which could be could be very very expensive. Fraser's similar trend. Um, fuzzy token matcher. I want to see if the uh, this this feature uh, is very efficient. And the, the final results are pretty good. So we use the different thresholds. Uh, intuitively, the larger the threshold is the tighter condition. Right? If the threshold becomes one, that means these results, they have to match exactly. Okay? Because this is a similarity. One means a perfect match. So if we increase the, the threshold, then the number of results uh, over multiple queries will reduce, and then the, the time will also reduce. So it means Lushin is doing a pretty good job uh, answering uh, similarity queries. Step of NLP. Uh, step of NLP. Uh, if if this is the input, then those red boxes will be the output. Uh, you can see that we have a time and, and organizations and the locations. This is the, will be output of the of the operator or the analyzer. And the results are not surprising, which is uh, step of NLP operator. Step of NLP package kind of slow. Okay. So for instance, when we use the, the whole time grows linear. For 5,000 records, it took, uh, when we try to get all entities, it took uh, a 320. If you do the math, so it means five, so each thousand takes 60 seconds, right? Each thousand takes 60 seconds. That means each document takes about 60 milliseconds. So that's, a, that's the step analyzer speed. And uh, it'd be really nice to see if even that one can be in the, can be indexable, but I I think that's that's pretty hard because they have some very sophisticated uh, language model to 
to process documents. But this is the way it is. Um, uh, this one we use a different uh, computer. Regex. So this is a, a case that is kind of a still pretty open it, uh, open ended. Uh, we we have good news and bad news. And the, the, the bad news is some of the common regular expressions. Uh, this algorithm doesn't work. That can, that's kind of very sad. Right? Like uh, email addresses, you know, for telephone numbers. A current algorithm doesn't work, but it also gives the opportunity to do something better. What is does it work? Mean? That doesn't work. Meaning, give wrong answer. Oh, oh. Mm, it would get, it become a scan. Yeah. You oh, can now oh, utilize right, the it's inefficient. Inefficient. Doesn't work means it's inefficient. Yes, yeah. yeah so, so the yeah, I mean, once it by works, I mean, it'd be really nice to have a inverse index to get the candidates. Yeah, there's some there's some existing work on creating index for like. Java type of the regular expression. Yes. Um, yeah, and, and some of the uh, common expressions, they they're not indexable. Maybe to be more precise, and they're not indexable. But I, I also I ha we have some ideas about how to make them indexable. But that's our kind of uh, future work. Um, in addition, uh, it, it could be very controversial to come up with some meaningful regular expressions. And this is the some expressions that our students came up with. I just don't take them very literally. So for these uh, expressions. Uh, we, we, the reason we put system T here, first, want to make sure that the comparison is fair. I mean, these two approaches are very different. One is the index based, one is uh, the scan based. The purpose really is to show if we were to use this uh, text to be as a preprocessor, how many candidates can we can prone. Then later, you don't need to do many, many things. Um, and the, the, our, f our observation is for some of the queries, we were able to reduce the number of candidates to only 10% of the original data set. Right? 10% means you reduce the time to about 10%. Okay? It depends on the, the real expression. Um, and it, it heavily depends on how, com co how complex your real expression is. Uh, and another question is, people magically use uh, the, the number three, which is trigrams. Okay? But it's interesting to see whether some other techniques can be used, maybe other different than length, Bigrams or four grams, or some combination of different lengths. Uh, in the past, we did one paper called a V-gram, which means you can use grams of, of different lengths based on the frequencies of the grams. So I think this is a place where many other algorithms can can be introduced to make regex expression much more efficient. But some some of the comparison not exactly a fair comparison, right? Right. Like for example, for mosquito question mark or marketing, you can rewrite them into dictionary. Correct. And then the system the operator for dictionary is much more efficient <coughs> than yeah. regular expression. That's yeah. why the purpose of this comparison is not to show we are fast. That's not the purpose. You want yeah. to give you some numbers. Right? Yeah. Right. I, I think the main uh, takeaway here is that we could apply some of the, let's say I have very complex uh, regular expression or complex rules in system T, but we can filter the document we need to process first using some simple queries like this, then we can speed up the overall uh, performance because we can narrow down the set of documents very fast, then we can do more complex uh, processing Correct. afterwards. And plus, I mean, you have a very nice uh, proprietary automaton evaluator, right? That's not available on the market. And we, we did one experiment for one regex. We use a standard Java regex evaluator and uses a system TC evaluator, yours is much faster than the yeah, one available yeah. on the market. So this is something you yeah, have. Yeah, we have our own regex evaluator, which is much faster. Question? Question? OK. So I will skip this one here, because this one can be very controversial. Um, uh, open problems. Um, I already mentioned uh, some of them. Uh, one direction is we want to add more operators. We only implement some basic operators. Some other operators I would like to add include you know, some people, uh, stu some students are working on join operator, uh, also influenced by the system T, you know, how to join the inputs, uh, the outputs of multiple operators based on the, based on the span conditions. Uh, these two spans that overlap. So they can do a join. Uh, and the other example uh, is based on the national, uh, Rep Republican National uh, Convention speech. I, I cheated there because for, for that scenario to work, a current operator does not work. It does not just help. For that operation to work, you have to be able to compare 
two documents. So it'd be very nice to say, I give you one document or even a set of documents, find all the same documents. Right? So you treat documents as input. Um, uh, sentiment analysis, even other very, very commonly used uh, uh, operations can be modeled at operators. Um, red expression is something that's technically very interesting. And uh, we see the, the value of regex, that see few studies on how to make it indexable. And uh, we, we, we have a few ideas to make them more efficient. One idea is the current algorithm ignores the position information completely. The position information means in, uh, these two uh, sub-expressions, they have to appear within a certain distance. Okay? And this, this one to the translation, this information is ignored completely. But, uh, but if Lushin can support this kind of a proximity search, where you can specify some conditions and positions, then we m might be able to come up with one algorithm where when you generate a final Boolean expression, that expression also includes some position information that can significantly reduce the number of candidates. Because the main bottleneck is the number of candidates. and want to make it as tight as possible. And even during the translation phase, some of the decisions made by the algorithm are still uh, up to discussion because they, they, can, they can be better. Uh, we have not done the language yet, because we're still in this uh, runtime design phase. Um, <coughs> but once we have the language, those issues will come out very naturally, how to do query compiling, uh, rewriting, query optimization. Now, a new field is becoming very interesting, which is how to do text-based uh, uh, cost estimation and the cardinality estimation. Okay? And I think I, I talked to, I didn't talk to about the, to some of you, forgot to go. And one reason that DB2 didn't take text uh, very with it at the first class, then one of the reasons was text is hard to deal with when you do, uh, uh, when you do query optimization because it's, it's hard to predict the cost of some of the operations in terms of the cardinality and uh, the CPU and uh, other resources come from. <coughs> uh, the other thing I, we want to do in this space is. Um, if you, so far, we only do one task, we get the results, and that, that's it. But it'd be really nice if you can also put the annotation information back to somewhere, as some, some labels, as some metadata, possibly in the machine or another open source package, we're looking at the Derby at, for now. If you can add this additional annotation information into your store, and then you can enhance your query language to specify some conditions using the additional annotations. For example, you could run something to say, oh, run some classification algorithm about the, the, the meaning of each document. Maybe this document is about politics, that document is about entertainment, this document is about sports. If you do these annotations and store the annotations somewhere in your whole system, later you can say, and for all those uh, sports do documents, or, or for all documents that have already some digits inside it, I run some operations. And this additional annotation information could be utilized to make the application easier to write. You can still avoid scanning all the documents one by one. So that's not quite clear to me how the annotations can be stored uh, separately and how to modify the language on top of the an annotations. And then now currently with just doing informa information extraction, we believe text is a very rich area. There are many other things we can do beyond the information extraction. So this summary of where we are, um, this uh, this box uh, is encapsulating what we have done at the library. Uh, we're still uh, uh, working hard in this box, and we're going to we're going to stabilize all the operators, make them more performant, and get more uh, insights of those things. And we want to optimize. Next, we we, we may optimize the regex expression evaluator, and then and once we make this one in a good shape would like to jump into the, the query language, query compiler, optimizer phase. That's going to be future work. So I'm very proud to do this work with a team of uh, very energetic students. And it's amazing to, it's, for me it's an experiment. This is the work that for the first time I'm doing with this whole bunch of students. Uh, and so software engineering becomes very challenging because we all know students, they come and go, and how can we make sure when they, when they go, the work can still continue. And These are all your students? They're all my students. But some, most of them are masters and PhD, uh, masters and undergrad students. It's a lot of students. Yes. And this, I mean, you can see the activities on, on the GitHub. 
and each of them contributes to some of the operators. So each operator has about uh, two to three students working, uh, being worked on. And some of them are still working as they speak uh, currently. Uh, we put everything on uh, GitHub, uh, so you can see what you see our dirty laundry. Uh, if any comments, uh, you can. I would love to get your feedback. So that concludes my talk. Uh, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> so, questions or more questions? Okay. Uh, initially, you said that uh, one goal is for the system to be flexible when you have updates. Uh, operators, the guidelines, expressions, and dictionaries. So, so you can only uh, update a small number of operations. But I don't think I followed how you did that. So updates, well, so the updates, like currently, since machine supports updates, uh, we, we have not done the operator yet, but we will which is operator using which the, the user can add more documents or delete documents. So it, because it's more like a database system, information I, can be more modified. When you change a small number of documents, you can limit the operation to these updated documents. But suppose you make a change to regular expressions, how do you know that you can be a small number of documents? Oh. You might have to remove just to your blanket or every yeah, the question is really about. Yeah, the question is about uh, if we modify regular expression, what do we do with the new regular expression? Maybe I was not very clear. Uh, the motivation of our work is previously, if you don't have such a system, if you modify your regular expression, you had to scan documents against one by one. I think that's what he does. But if if this one is successful, then if you have a new regular expression, you still need to run it again. But the difference is now we have index available for you. And the index, which is already pre-built, can make the evaluation of the new regular expression much, much more efficient. That's the value proposition. I see. Of this so, so it's, the index is part of the regular expression itself. The index is part of the storage, and the new regular expression will be converted to possibly a new Boolean expression. The new, the new Boolean square will be answered using the index structure, and the index can help you make it faster. But that's the, that's a benefit. So, can you also regular expression? So, some of the systems that also scan the So first, let me repeat the question. The question is, uh, in some cases, the user can give a whole bunch of work expressions. And then, since uh, they have so many expressions, they try to optimize the evaluation of this a lot of our expressions on the documents uh, using a scan-based approach. Uh, uh, whether we have done this kind of a comparison. But the answer is no. We, will not, we haven't done anything uh, in that space yet. I mean, the, our current focus is really about a very a simple case where you have a, doc a document collection, you have one regex, how to make it uh, uh, very efficient. And so now there are two dimensions here, right? One dimension is you make it, you, you have more regular expressions. Uh, the other one is your, your, your documents can become indexable. For us, we take the, the second dimension, which is ma making the uh, in, uh, documents indexable. Now, once we, we do a good job in this space, uh, the, the question you asked is, still, is very valid, which is if we already have an uh, index uh, available for the document collection and we have a whole bunch of regular expressions, how to optimize this whole bunch using the, 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 those indexes? I don't have the answer to the question yet. Uh, the question is whether we have compared our work with earlier work in 2000s 
um, storing text inside database systems, and then supporting the operations inside database systems? The answer is no, we, we didn't do it. And, and also, I'm just curious, at the end, uh, does any of these systems become like, really deployed in any, any application? <laughs> yeah, but I'm, I, I, I'm not criticizing any, anybody. I'm just saying, uh, I, I personally, I believe, I personally, I believe, uh, pushing this operations inside the database system uh, is not pushing inside the database system. They are implementing their own database system for storing text documents and then doing information extraction on the text Oh, they did everything from scratch. Yeah. Oh, so and then I need to take a look at their yeah, work. So Yeah, I would love to take a look at the, the system and uh, even play the systems. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one thing I, I could be very religious here. The one thing I care a lot about is <coughs> making the, make sure the code is re re reusable. Uh, so there's a very strong system aspect to it, right? The idea can be the same, but you could have different executions. So I, I'm uh, given my past experiences, I, I'm very rigorous about the software engineering aspect. I will take a look for sure. I, I will. I will. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the for the pointer. Any other questions? Uh, are the systems support multiple languages? Uh, the question is whether we support multiple languages. Uh, the short answer, short answer is yes, because Lucian supports it. We we can get a free ride. But I think there's some tricky things here, right? When you use Lucian standard analyzer or any of the analyzers, some underlying assumptions or underlying implicit operation is doing. So for example, in standard analyzer, doing stemming, doing stop words, removal, and so on. So how do you convey that to the user? It, because the user may come, the results may look surprising to the user because uh, yeah, I mean, it's I not exactly much. I think the, 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 the deeper question is what kind of a users that we are targeting. I don't think that this system will be used by some user that does not that, have any knowledge about this space. I think we are targeting those experienced users. That's, that's my conjecture. For people who are willing to give it a try, they should have some knowledge in this space. And they have to rely on the documentation to see the meaning of each analyzer. I, I think that's, that's my, my view in that direction. I mean, as some person without any training in this space, very likely they're not the users for this system. So they need to understand for each of the analyze what are the... Yes, yes. And we can use the standard uh, uh, documentation. Mm -hmm. and that's one benefit of using machine. Right? Mm -hmm. One main reason, because we don't want to spend lots of time implementing different analyzers for different languages. That's just too much work. And that's not a focus of our work. So th that's a trade-off we have, we have decided. <coughs> Other questions? I, th I think we are going to have more discussion <laughs> in the afternoon. <laughs> Talk about how do we. Um, okay. Well, uh, yeah, thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thank you.